you guys are able to turn with me to Luke 18. We're going to be Appreciation Month because I'm pretty sure after this you're really going to appreciate Pastor Jesse. <laughs> so, <laughs> with that being said, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, uh, I've come before you, Lord, because I need help. We need help, Lord. Um, thank you so much for your word that you've given to us. I ask that you would help me to handle it correctly. Help me to uh, to be a conduit, Lord, of your word directly to the people. Help it be edifying, edifying to the to everyone here. Lift everyone up, encourage one, one another, be convicting, Lord. We ask this in Christ's name. <clears throat> okay, so we're in Luke 18. We're going to start at the chapter, I mean, verse 18. We're going to go to 27. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All of these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when he heard the, these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with man is possible with God. We praise God for the reading of his word. So anyone here, any hunters in the room? Any hunters? Am I the only one? I know my dad. So... It's kind of, fun, kind of funny, my mom and dad are here today, not because they knew I was preaching, because they just found out late, late last night, and my, my older sister too, they just happened to be here, so, um, so any, any hunters in the room, I know we got Tim, my, my parents, but anyway, I grew up hunting, I loved hunting, I had a lot of great, great stories with my dad, um, learning, learning how to hunt, you know, we did a lot of different kinds of hunting, small game, deer, we did a lot of coon hunting growing up too, so... And I do, so I currently still do archery hunting, rifle hunting. So anyway, one thing I always was uh, interesting to me was flintlock, flintlock hunting. Anyone familiar with flintlock, muzzleloader? Yeah, no, 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 hold on. Too bad Dan's not here because he would know. <laughs> so anyway, so muzzleloader is kind of old school. There's only, there's only two different states that actually do this. I think it's Pennsylvania and Michigan. It's old school flintlock. You actually pour the powder in, put the bullet in. So I mean, people get into this, right? So there's actually a Facebook page dedicated to muzzleloader hunting, which I became actually a part of. And um, these people get really into it. I mean, they get the outfits, the coonskin hat, the moccasins, all that stuff. So I'm like, I'm like, well, <laughs> I've, I've done all this other hunting. Let me try my hand in this hunting. And so I'm not, in a, I'm not in an arrogant way, but like, I was like, I, I think I can handle this, right? So, so I get all the gear I need. I got the CVA, I got the, the 50 caliber, 50 caliber CVA, got the quick loads, these Sabbat bullets that are like high end. I got all the gear, right? I looked apart. I looked apart. So I go out there hunting. <clears throat> One of the first days I go out there hunting, sets up perfectly, right? Got these deer coming in. Next thing I know, they're all around me. I'm like, oh man, this is no problem, right? So just like, just like I would any other time, put the gun up. If you guys ever hunted muzzleloader, there's like, it's different than a rifle. So you get a flash in the pan, goes into the barrel, and then explodes out. So anyway, the deer up with a, and then click, nothing. I'm like, what is going on here? So I was like, all right, so I do it again, and then click, and, and it kaboom, right? I mean, it's like, I was like, okay. And so you kind of almost have to wait for the smoke to clear a little bit. So, so like I was looking at the smoke to clear. I'm like looking for this deer flopping over dead, and all the deer just kind of looks up like, <laughs> like, I was like, I was like, ah. Uh, <laughs> So need, needless to say, like I went back home with my coonskin tail between my hat or between my legs. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, the, why why am I telling this story, right? Why am I telling this story? The reason I'm telling this story because like, even though I looked the part of the flintlock hunter, this great flintlock hunter in Pennsylvania, I was actually a poser. I was a fake, a fraud, a um, a uh, um, yeah. What was 
it wasn't a, a real one. So anyway, so I'm telling this, I'm making this transition here because today we're, we're learning about it. it's a fascinating encounter between a rich young ruler and, and Jesus. As a matter of fact, this is, this is in, I think, three different, uh, three different uh, books, Gospels. It's recorded in Matthew, Mark, and, of course, Luke. Matthew refers to him as being young. This passage here in Luke refers to him as being a ruler. But every count says that he is, that he is wealthy. So anyway, so as we go through this, the main idea I want you guys to get through this is that it is impossible for man to, to earn salvation. Salvation is only made possible by grace through the work of Jesus Christ. Let me repeat that again. So it's, it is possible, I'm sorry, it is impossible for man to earn salvation. Salvation is only made possible by God's grace through the work of Jesus Christ. So we'll be studying two points in relation to the first one is the impossibility of salvation. It's the impossibility of salvation. So let's look back in our text here. So uh, uh, verse 18, and a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So here we have a guy who Luke was, Luke's referring to him as a ruler. Most think he's probably a ruler of a synagogue, which would have been a pretty impressive feat, uh, being someone of that young age. That, and um, he had great education, great social standing. He was no doubt very influential. Um, he's referred to having great wealth. This, this guy has been very successful in his young career. Um, this guy was most likely looked up highly in his community. Um, I, was, I was joking. So if, there, if the Jewish kids back in the day put posters up on their wall, there's a good chance this guy was one on one of those posters. Is that still a thing? Do people still do I, I Actually, uh, during Sunday school class, I heard that some people actually still do have posters on their wall. It's kids, I don't know. Mine was Michael Jordan, but that's beside the point. All right, so anyway, but by this guy's, but this guy, even as success, successful as he was, by his own admission, he lacks eternal life. So there are some, so there's some traits of this, of this wrong young ruler displayed here. Um, as the account of Mark refers to him, if you look, read Mark, it refers to him as running up and kneeling before him, showing a sense of desperation. So he's exposing himself in front of everyone that they're saying that I, have, I devoted myself to the law. I've been educated to the highest possibility. I've done everything I was supposed to do in the sight of everyone around me, yet I still lack eternal life. Or at least he's admitting he's lack, lacking the assurance of eternal life. A lot of guys get on this guy too because he, he's saying, what must I do? And yeah, it's true. He's like, what must I do to earn, or obtain, uh, obtain eternal life? But this is the life that he knew, like he, that he was taught from a very young age that salvation can be earned by what we can do. And uh, so now he's coming to Jesus asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But isn't it as Christians, it's interesting, this is exactly what we want to hear from someone, right? Like, what, would I, what, would I, what, do I, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This guy's a hot prospect. He does not have some of the barriers uh, that many have come before. That have that may, there doesn't have many barriers that, that many have when coming to Jesus. As far as like, is there even a real God? He's not really even influenced by like a false religion or anything like that. So he already believes in the God of the Old Testament. He knows the law, and he's devoted to the Ten Commandments, and he re, and he realizes he lacks eternal life. He's a top prospect. Like, humanly speaking, he appears so close. He's a seeker. I mean, if we're, I'm just like, Jesus, like, lead him to prayer. Walk an aisle. Just have him find a Bible or something. Like, he seems, he seems so cl- close. So let's lo- look at verse 19. What did Jesus say? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So what kind of response is that? Like, when you were, if you were reading that, like, were you guys ever confused in that response? Like, is Jesus not really calling himself good there? Is he denying his own deity? No, I, I, no, absolutely not. That's not the point. The, at least for a moment, Jesus evades the question and poses this question to the ruler and how he addresses him. Like, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? <clears throat> no one is good except God alone. So this, dru- this dru- ruler, when he was addressing Jesus, as good, he was doing so in the absolute term, a term that was only meant for God, the term of perfection. So Jesus answers, perhaps, perhaps probably would offend, would offend many people um, when he said only God is good. Because if you, if you ask anyone on the street, right, it's like, are you a good person? What's generally most everyone going to say? Yeah, yeah, I'm a good person. Yeah, yeah, we make mistakes, we're not perfect, but overall, we're good people. But what's God's word say about this? 
Like in Romans 3, verses 11 to 12, it says, None is righteous. No, not one. No one seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So the ruler was addressing Jesus as good in an absolute term. The problem is this guy had no idea who he was talking to. He does not know that he's face to face with God incarnate. That He doesn't know that he's talking to a sinless teacher, not just a good teacher. So what's key is that this statement here reveals this guy's belief that being, by being a good enough person and obeying the law good enough that you can gain your salvation. So Jesus was challenging this ruler's own assumption of goodness. He was essentially a fake Christian, a superficial Christian, kind of like I was with the whole Flintlock hunter, hunting thing. See, he, this guy was a fake superficial Christian. And Jesus' response reveals that he's not interested in superficial fake Christianity. So let's keep going here. Verse 20, Jesus continues, You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. So that's another interesting response, too, because I take an evangelism, cla- evangelism classes at Liberty. I'm sure LBC has them. But how do you think Jesus would be graded in this response? Good chance he probably would have failed most of the classes I was a part of anyway. So it's very interesting because this question was posed in different places in the Bible as well. And how did, how did they respond? In Acts, when, if, when the jailer asked Paul and Barnabas, what must I do to be saved? What was the response? Do you remember? Acts wasn't that long ago, guys. No, no. It, well, he, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and you will be saved. And when Jesus began his ministry after John the Baptist was arrested, what was Jesus saying? He was, he was out there proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, repent and believe. So this is an interesting response. Like, what was Jesus doing? Jesus, okay, Jesus does have an advantage over us, right? So he can see the hearts of people that we, we can't. So we're kind of like, well, Jesus, what are you doing here? But um, it's also interesting, too, that he mentioned... The, the, the commandments that he mentioned here are the second half of the Ten Commandments. Um, that he, it's interesting he chose them. Um, it's possible that he chose them because these are the ones that are probably most visible that you can see, others can see that, hey, he actually is doing a good job keeping the law. He hasn't killed anyone. He hasn't stole. He hasn't done all this stuff. So, so it's interesting that Jesus pointed, pointed that out. But then how, what did, what's his response after he said that? He says, verse 21, and he said, all of these things I have kept from my, my youth. So he seems awfully confident in his answer in here. I don't know if he breathed a sigh of relief or not, but is that what I have to do to, to, to have a, eternal life? Is it keep the Ten Commandments? Do not steal, do not murder, commit adultery, honor my parents? Well, that's what Jesus said to do. It's, I'm, he was probably thinking, I've done a pretty good job so far. So, but, but really, did he? Did he really? Jesus really could have argued with him here and said, were you not around when I gave the Sermon on the Mount? Like, if I was him, I probably would have texted him a link and said, hey, check this out later, because you are not, you, you're not following the, the Ten Commandments um, like you're supposed to. Like, have you ever, have, you may have not killed anybody, but have you ever uh, got mad or angry at anybody unjustly? You may have not committed adultery, but have you ever looked at a woman with lustful intent? So he could have ended it just by expounding on what it really means to keep the law. So you see, he, he didn't understand that he was a lawbreaker and that it was impossible to keep the law. So this is, this is huge. So he was using the law as a measuring stick to, to make himself feel better, not as a way to see how short he has fallen and how simple that he was. But Jesus didn't argue with him there. He didn't. Let's look at verse 22. Verse 22. So when Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Here's another interesting, uh, interesting response for Jesus, because is he really saying that in order to receive eternal life, that we need to sell all of our stuff and give to the poor? No, not at all. This back and forth dialogue between these two is fascinating. It's kind of like Jesus, like a skilled surgeon. He was cutting through different layers and getting to the real issue to identify the actual cancer. So what Jesus was trying to do was get the, this man to realize that he was not even capable of keeping the first commandment. Do you guys remember what the first commandment is? You shall have no other gods before me. You see, his wealth and all the stuff that had become his God, and Jesus was, Jesus was pointing this out to him. You can't keep the law. You can't even get past the first one. Your attitude towards the law is all wrong. The law is there to show us how, fall, how, how, how we fall short. And since we fall short, that we are under the judgment 
of breaking the law. And the only way that you can receive eternal life is by recognizing this and repenting. So you must see yourself as a sinner, unable to, unable to earn salvation. You must see the Lord Jesus Christ as the all-consuming priority of your life, even if it costs you everything. In this case, sell everything that he had. Salvation comes from acknowledging sin, acknowledging the need for uh, a divine forgiveness because one is unable to earn salvation on his own and leaving the earthly priorities behind and following Jesus. So here he is. He's at a crossroads. So how does he respond? Look at verse 23. So he says, but when Jesus heard these things, he became very, I'm sorry, but when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. It didn't, take him, it didn't take him too long to make his decision here. He didn't ask for more time to think about it. He didn't ask for more clarification. What Jesus was saying to him was, was crystal clear. It, it, it really did appear that he wanted God in his life. I mean, he wanted Jesus to lead him to God. He wanted the peace and the rest and the joy, happiness, assurance, the hope, heaven. But he wanted all that in addition to and not in the place of his priorities. See, his priorities here was really, was really himself. His, pri- his priority was fix me. Make me feel better about my life. Make me feel better about me, my future. Make me feel better about life after death. But his priority was not eternal life. His priority was not the kingdom of God. His priority was his possessions, his power, position, his religion, his money. And he could not, he could not abandon it. He couldn't abandon it. It was very sad. He would, not, in the words of, he would not, in the words of Jesus, lose everything to save his life. He would rather save everything and lose his own soul. So Jesus has no interest in temporary converts. They're so easily won, so easily lost. So here we are, this hot prospect. He walks away without salvation. So that's, that's the first point. The impossibility of salvation. It's impossible to earn salvation on our own. So next we, sh- next we see Jesus share with his disciples and us a very valuable lesson, which leads into our second point today. So the second point is, it's pretty easy, it's the possibility of salvation. The possibility of salvation. So let's look at verse uh, 24. So Jesus, seeing that he had become very sad, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter into the kingdom of God. Now this was, this was a shock. How hard is it for those that are wealthy to enter into the kingdom of God? Like, are you kidding? They're probably thinking, are you kidding me? So you kind of almost have to put yourself in, in their culture. See, the wealthy Jews were looked at as being wealthy by way of God's favor and that he blessed them. Um, you, can, you can actually look at Job and look at Job's, Job's friends and their theology. They pour this on. This, this, you remember the story of Job. Job had trouble in his life and his friends piled this theology on him saying that, that you, you're this way because you sin, you're sinful. So, and also the flip side, if you have blessings and wealth in your life, it's because you're righteous. So listening to this, what Jesus was saying to them, listening to this came as such a shock. If it's difficult for a rich person to enter into heaven, how much harder is it for everyone else to, to, to enter in, into heaven? So how difficult is it? Well, Jesus answers in the next verse, verse 25. Jesus says, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So we see here that not only is it difficult, that it's absolutely impossible. It is impossible for a rich person or any person to obey the law perfectly enough to earn salvation. You would have better luck shoving a camel through the eye of a needle. Um, th- th- there are th- this text right here. It's interesting because there are people who like try to misinterpret this text because they don't really want to take Jesus literally here because the being literally be, being mean is impossible. So I heard one of the explanations is that in the original language, the word for camel was very close to rope. It was the word for rope? So maybe Jesus really meant just shoving rope through the eye of the needle. So man, that not as hard as shoving a camel through the eye of the needle. I don't know. I still think it'd be pretty hard. Um, another explanation was uh, is that the eye of the needle was some sort of n- n- gate, like in the walls around Jerusalem. Um, it was it was said to be so narrow that the camels actually had to get down on their knees and they had to squeeze through this little gate or whatever. There, but the thing of it is, this gate was never was never found. 
And I was listening to, I think it was uh, up here with John MacArthur. Um, he was saying, well, why would you use this little small little gate when you go 30 feet and walk around in, in the real gate, the normal gate? So that, that doesn't quite add up here. So, um, but the point of this, but but the point of the, the statement, Jesus actually clears up later in the next verse, in, in verse 27, where he actually does say it's impossible. So, but the camel, so the camel was the largest animal in Israel, and the eye of the needle was one of the smallest openings. So he was simply stating the extremeness of this impossibility. It's impossible for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God on his own merit. You cannot follow the law perfectly enough to gain eternal life. Because if we, have broke, if we have broken just one of God's laws, then we are guilty of every one of them, and we fall under, under the judgment. Again, this is probably shocking stuff to those around that could hear this. So, so how, did the, how did they respond? Now let's look at verse 26. So those who heard this said, then who can be saved? Who can be saved? If the rich can't be saved, who can be saved? Again, again, they, they go back to the way they were thinking. They were thinking that the rich had the best chance of earning salvation. And if Jesus is now saying that the rich, that it's literally easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich person to be saved, like who can be saved? If the rich person has no chance of being saved, then I definitely have sh- no chance because God has not shown favor on me, a poor person. So who can be saved? So they were, they were in complete shock at this point. But praise God, he doesn't, Jesus does not leave him hanging. This is the best part here, here coming up. Let's look at what Jesus says in verse 27. But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So the process of gaining eternal life is only made possible with God. From the beginning to the middle to the end, it's solely possible because of God. As R.C. Sproul says, here's a quote from him, it says, one of the hardest lessons for us to ever grasp from sacred scripture is that the only possible way to inherit eternal life is relying on grace and grace alone. See, this man missed the kingdom of God after meeting with Jesus face to face. He asked the right questions, but he missed, he missed the answer. There are so many people today who think they're good enough, that they do enough work, they do enough striving, have enough virtue to get into the king, that, to, that they can get into the kingdom of God. But the only person who was ever good enough to make it into heaven by way of merit was Jesus Christ. The same message that this rich man needed to hear is the same message that we need to hear today. And that is that our justification is by the righteousness of Christ and by his righteousness alone and not by ours. We are all lawbreakers. We are all guilty of breaking the law. We are all, all were born in flesh by not being able to keep the very first commandment. We are born with other gods before us than, than Jehovah. And we must all repent and follow him. So then my question here to you today is, are you trying to get to heaven apart from repenting and following Christ? Are you trying to do your best to earn eternal life? Because you can't. You can't, you can't do it. And it's only made possible with God through the work of Jesus. We must repent of our sins, believe that Jesus died, took the penalty of our sins, was buried, and was raised to life three days later. That is the only way to earn salvation. That is the only way to earn eternal life. Let's pray. Father, God, we just thank you so much for, for the, the gift that you gave us through Jesus, for taking the punishment for us on the cross, Lord, and by him, we have the possibility of, of eternal life, of spending eternity with you one day. Lord, just ask that you would just make this clear to those who, who don't understand this completely, Lord, that you would just work in their heart, that you would just um, break them down, Lord, help them to understand their need for the Savior, and that there's nothing they can do on their own apart from you to, get to, to, get, to gain eternal life. Lord, we just love you. We just thank you so much for, for your word. We just, and we just ask this in Christ's name. Amen.